listen for what the Spirit is saying to the Church today. We pray for illumination. God of Easter surprises, on this first day of the week, you come to us bringing peace. On this day, as on every day, you speak peace. Speak peace into our chaos, fear and confusion. May it be today, gracious God, in this very time, that you breathe peace into our lives. And may it be that we share peace with others. Amen. Both our scriptures lessons this morning are from the Christian scriptures. First reading from the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And on his accounts, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Reading from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen 
and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Have you heard the one about the three people who went to become policemen? One was an Italian, one was an Israeli, and one was Australian. They passed their interviews and then they were asked the difficult questions. The first question was, what is the capital of Australia? Ah, said the Italian, that would be Canberra. Excellent. The second question is, who killed Jesus Christ? Ah, said the Italian, that would be the Jews. The Jews killed Jesus. The examiner said, I'll let you know. The second man came in, an Israeli. What is the capital of Australia? Oh, it's Canberra, he said. And who killed Jesus? Oh, that would be the Romans. The Romans killed Jesus. Fine, said the examiner. I'll get back to you. Then the Australian came in. What is the capital of Australia? Canberra, he answered. Ah, said the examiner. Who killed Jesus Christ? The Australian thought for a moment. Then said, can I get back to you with that one? The examiner said, yes, call in tomorrow once you know the answer. The Australian went home and his wife said, how did you do? He said, I got the job. They've already put me on a murder investigation. Now, if you've ever watched murder investigations or read books, they're, they're very popular. Every second TV show seems to be about solving particularly difficult murders. First there's the question, where is the body? Generally in a murder program it happens right at the beginning. I always get tense if we haven't yet found the body and then we're 10 minutes in. They're setting the scene for how the murder is set up. But I like it when we start with the body. And then, of course, you have to discount anyone who could possibly have done it because it's bound to have been done by someone who couldn't possibly have done it. If you change your thinking in murder mysteries, you can solve them much more easily. The one with the perfect alibi is, of course, the person who's guilty. Now, this just isn't because my name is Butler and the butler always did it. Nothing like that. But I wonder if the story of the resurrection can be likened to a murder mystery. You see, Thomas is always cast in a negative light. But if you think of Thomas as Hercule Poirot, it starts to make a lot more sense. Thomas is using the little grey cells. Thomas will not believe until he has seen proof. Now, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas was not with them. He missed out on an experience that all the other disciples had had that convinced them that Jesus was risen from the dead. 
Of course, these very same disciples were those who doubted when the women came in with the story of the risen Jesus. Because it all depends on who you can trust. Now, in those days, women couldn't give evidence in a court of law. They were considered too hysterical to, in fact, be able to be good witnesses. And the word for hysteria comes from the word for uterus. Just having a uterus makes you hysterical. Or so they thought. So if we can't trust the women's versions of what's happened, can we trust the men's version? Thomas said, no, I will not believe. I will not believe until I place my finger in the holes in his hand and my hand in the hole in his side. I will not believe. I'm wondering, today, if Jesus had come, the tables might be reversed. We might have one who believes and the others who doubt. Some years ago, a theologian named Val Webb, an Australian, wrote a book called In Defense of Doubt. And it was hailed as a great breakthrough by people who were over the age of 60. It was a book written for older people because only older people have problems with doubt. Younger people have problems with faith. They don't have problems with doubt. I wish I had a dollar for every time someone has said to me, I don't believe what all those other people in the church believe as if they're the unique free spirit, the Thomas, the Hercule Poirot of their time. It's as if there is a huge banquet of things to swallow and they will have none of it or select little bits from here and from there. People who doubt and who are worried about doubting are older people. They've been told all their lives, this is what we as Christians believe. This is what it means to be a person of faith. And if they don't find themselves in 100% alignment, they then consider themselves no better than Thomas, who doubted. The web says, be free. Be free. Doubting is good. It's a sign that you're still awake upstairs. You're thinking things through. You're solving the mysteries rather than accepting them all. Doubt is a good thing. So why do we still speak badly of Thomas? For young people, the problem is completely different. They need to be convinced of why they should believe. It seems our world is divided into those who are skeptical and those who are conspiracy theorists. There are conspiracies on just about everything. We're all being fooled. If only we knew the truth. And the skeptics are here to guide us in the way of truth. Is that the case? Is that the case about people who say all this is folly, that they are in fact correct? I have a lovely children's book that is packed up with most of my books called The King at the Door. I'm not, I can't remember who the author was nor the illustrator, but it's a beautiful children's book about a young boy called Little Dorrit who works at an inn. It's clearly medieval times and Little Dorrit has come in to tell the innkeeper that the king is at the door. 
the door of the inn. And it goes through a list of all the things that the king requires. And the innkeeper is incredibly skeptical. Ho, ho, little Dorrit, he says. If the king is hungry, here, let me give him the scraps I was saving for the dog. And if the king needs a ride back to the palace because he's come a long way and is weary walking, the innkeeper volunteers to lend the pig for him to ride on. We have in this lovely children's story someone who is a great believer, the gullible little Dorrit, and someone who is the skeptic the older and wiser innkeeper. There is no punchline to the story. The man dressed as a beggar leaves the inn, but the final picture speaks volumes. It is a carriage pulled up at the door of the inn and someone in rich robes inviting little Dorrit to come up into the carriage. You see, there's healthy skepticism, but there's also healthy belief. If we were all skeptics, nothing would ever be done. No one would step out in faith. No one would believe that the impossible is sometimes possible. No one would invent things because they'd be skeptical that they ever could. No one would venture from their comfort zone. No one would care about another because they'd have no reason to do so. Generally, when Jesus meets people in his risen form, he begins with, do not be afraid. I think he catches a look in the eye of horror. These people are not expecting him. These people have difficulty recognizing him. He doesn't look identical to he did before. So he begins with saying, do not be afraid. Do not fear. But this time, when he comes and stands among them, he doesn't say that. He says, peace be with you. The ancient greeting of the Middle East, to wish one another peace as the greatest of gifts and the most elusive. Peace. A blessing, not an instruction to cover over your fear or to have a stiff upper lip or a backbone. No, be with peace. When Kenan Callahan was here many years ago, he introduced me to a new saying. He would say something and then he'd say, but be at peace and went on to explain something. Be at peace. Peace be with you. Do we give one another peace as a blessing? It seems that for most of the disciples, the fear had gone. The fear of seeing the risen Lord had been replaced. I don't know what with, but they were no longer afraid. This is the greatest proof of the resurrection, that disciples went from fearing to being the bold speakers who were unafraid of death, persecution, and suffering. Something happened to them, and not just to one or two, but to many 
that convinced them that people of belief outnumber the skeptics. That people of belief make the difference. I have a friend who occasionally works in Indonesia. And at times we've said, how do you get on with the local people? Now he's a faithful Christian and he says, I tend to get on a little bit better than my secular colleagues. When asked why, he said, well, the Indonesians are strong people of faith. They know what faith they have. And they relate better to someone else of faith than someone with no faith. Ah. Perhaps that's why Christians are attuned to the plight of Muslim refugees. Because we can imagine and we can understand people of faith better than we can understand people with no faith. What difference does faith make? A great deal. You may or may not be familiar with the research into people who attend church regularly. That's not to say they have faith, but that they attend church regularly they live seven years longer than the average population. Seven years. That's significant. It's very significant. Seven years longer. What a pity it's at the wrong end of your life. Wouldn't it be better if you had seven extra years in your 20s? Or your 30s? Or your 60s? Hmm. Where would you put those seven extra years? You see, I have three grandchildren. And of course, I like to treat them all fairly. But sometimes, when I'm asking would they like something to eat or drink, I begin with the youngest. Because it's well known that the younger you are, the less patient you are. So if I begin by asking the youngest, we will probably have a better time. Unfortunately, the oldest one suffers from some anxiety. So she will be very keen to tell me what she wants while I'm busy asking the others what would they like. And at times I have to turn and say to her, you know that I will ask you what it is you want. You know that. So give me some time to ask them because you know I will ask you. If you're waiting for a piece of cake, that can be a very, very long time. But doesn't that explain what faith is? It's not belief in a certain set of criteria. It's not being able to ask the questions put by the examiner. It's a trust in a person. The person of Jesus Christ. If I had not gone to prepare a place for you, would I have told you that I have? Peace be with you. Peace. Perfect peace.